um, staff orders. Mm -hmm. I aspirated um, the fluid, send it for a gram strain uh, and, a, and a culture, put the guy on the antibiotics orally. And uh, it, it was just, um, uh, the fluid was just not normal looking uh, as usual, which is just uh, uh, like jelly or this was kind of too, too fluid, the uh, positive strength test where uh, you get drops instead of a, uh, just a, uh, like a string yeah. when, you, when you let the fluid out. Um, and um, I, I sent him home. Um, so I, I got a call, and uh, or I called him, and he, he had a temperature of 103. Wow. Um, so I got my assistant, and I went over to his house, picked him up, took him straight to the hospital, went to the operating room without stopping any place, and. Uh, uh, open it up, yeah, and let the pus out. Okay, uh, he he had septicemia. Wow, yeah, wow. And, uh, he he was a alcoholic, and uh, he had more than one infection in his career. Okay, um, that I took care of. So anyway, okay. um. That, that that was an interesting experience. So so it's not an innocuous kind of a condition. Okay. It, it can be uh, bad news. Yeah, good or bad. But but it's a very very common um, condition. You aspirate it, put a little cortisone in it. That's the fastest way to take care of it. Good, Jennifer. What do you think of this case? Okay, so here we have some sagittal and axial images of the elbow, and it looks like there's some subcutaneous edema kind of along the dorsal elbow, but I'm not sure if it's fluid signal. Um, it's not, it's a little bit more laterally located than I would expect to be in a bursa. Now, th this uh, these are old images before we had PD. Uh, fat suppressed type images. <clears throat> These are T true T1s and a true uh, non uh, fast spinaco T2s. And we can see just a lot of soft tissue thickening here and low signal intensity that doesn't really look like typical fluid. Mm, I see. So maybe this could be compatible with a chronic bursitis? Actually, this is more acute. This is actually subcutaneous hemorrhage in this area. Also, from resting the elbow, again, it's. Uh, <clears throat> probably a rupture of the vein and some venous oozing into this area. Uh, again, due to the trauma of the bony prominence against the hard object that it was resting on. Michael, here's a patient who has elbow and forearm pain. That, uh, was that somebody that you, uh, you knew, John, or? No. Um, this one looks like it, it, it was um, a significant acute trauma, um, doesn't it? Uh, well, I, I think this is just kind of more chronic oozing and hemosiderin deposition into the subcutaneous tissues. Oh, I, I, I see. So it's basically you're saying it's a hematoma. Yeah, it's a chronic hematoma. Okay. Okay. Um, this is kind of a like axis of the forearm. Yeah, this is actually a PD and a, and a uh, T2. Okay. They don't look like they're fat sats, so I can't tell if there's like yeah, a no, the no, no, no fat suppression. Because the bones are still fatty. So yeah. I don't really see yeah. too much. So in this particular technique, it's a real, real T2, and the fat is normally lower in signal intensity. You haven't seen very many of these uh, because like nobody, do nobody does, benefits. nobody does true true T2s anymore. And this is actually too high signal intensity for the fat. So this is all edema within the fat. Okay. And this was someone else who had a lecrodon bursitis. They kind of ruptured 
and extended down along the uh, subcutaneous fat on the floor. So when's the last time? Because we, we learned that because of like the JJ coupling. We do have to learn that for physics boards. Oh, you do? Because okay. like the, the initial T2s, which I've never seen. And yeah, I've never seen. Don't have, the, the JJ couples are broken, so they are, the fat is still dark. And right. then I guess now the common, the you know, the T2s that we do with that spin echoes that they break that JJ coupling and they get, right. they turn bright. Yeah. Yes. That's right. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Ashio, what do you think of this one? And a kind of chronic vague pain in the forearm. Um, I see some focal edema, I think, between the fascial planes here. Okay. Uh, this lady was an avid gardener. Oh, okay. So um, it could have had um, a puncture wound and maybe developed a, an infection. And it looks like, yeah, there might be a thorn right there. Yeah. Yeah. MR of a thorn. And this patient would give antibiotics, it'd get better, they take them off antibiotics, it'd flare back up again. And so they just had to go in and remove the foreign body. Uh, uh, that, that, that by, by the way, is not easy to find. Right. Jennifer, what do you think of this case? Chronic uh, elbow pain. So here we can see that there's marked degenerative disease along the radiocapitular joint and ulnar trochlear joint with severe joint space narrowing. Um, I guess this could be seen with rheumatoid arthritis yeah. or the patient, gout. The patient has had prior surgery. Here's the MR scan. Okay. Uh, so here it looks like this is a CT arthrogram you or you said this is an MR. No, it's a CT arthrogram. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, again, we can see severe degenerative disease. It looks like there is some are some loose bodies. We can see the contrast surrounding the loose bodies there. Um, what kind of and loose lots of, are these? Oh, this is a prosthesis of the radial head. Uh, it looks like silicone. Hmm. It's a silicone synovitis. Like a chronic inflammatory reaction and arthritis. Yeah, this is a foreign body reaction to the silicone. And so all this is destructive arthritis from the foreign body reaction. Silicone has not been uh, uh, very helpful in uh, elbows or shoulders or even wrists or hands, uh, unfortunately. a lot of my images uh, so I'm seeing signal and fat, fatty atrophy along the here right where you're about to circle um, trying to figure out exactly what what's involving I assume this is is this a like do we have history is it a huge injury is this going to be some kind of like the patient developed a mass and gradually increasing elbow pain. Okay, so I guess one thing that could be considered like some either nervous like denervation or something like a myositis, even like. Yeah, like this is probably not in the muscle. Okay. Uh, that this actually turned out to be a foreign body, chronic foreign oh, body okay. reaction, uh, with a lot of the granulation tissue around it, and. You couldn't really see the foreign body very well. It was seen when they removed it pathologically. That was a 45-year-old male with three-month mass and inability to extend his elbow from Victorville, California. Um, there's focal edema in the subcutaneous soft tissues there. Um, it kind of extends into the muscle as well. Um, I'd be worried about an infection. Um, Okay. So, what kind of infection? I'm guessing like some fungal infection. Three months mass, okay, could be fungal. You can see it extends through the deep fascia, mm -hmm. but, which makes you concerned about infection, infection yeah. uh, and extends into the muscle mass here. Yep. So uh, is from Victorville, California. Does that help? Is it like co coxie? Or? 
Yeah. Yeah. This is uh, chronic coccidial mycosis. So, you know, if this were a typical uh, staph or strep, uh, you wouldn't expect it to be around for three months without the person really getting sick. So once you see it's chronic like this, you've got to think about the atypical mycobacteria, mycobacteria, fungal diseases, or coxie, or as we'll see in, I think maybe some cases now, but certainly later, if they're from Asia, you can also think about, uh, or other places, uh, uh, you can think about uh, uh, perizoa and uh, other, other kinds of infections. Okay, uh, Jennifer. Uh, may I say something, John? Sure, of course. Uh, Victorville has uh, a, a number of different uh, diseases. It's a, an interesting place to visit. Uh, Is it? Uh, the only case of <laughs> only case of uh, tertiary syphilis that I saw in my practice was from Victorville. Okay. Well, they, they have fun out there. Okay, Jennifer. Okay, this is a five-year-old inline skater with pain and swelling for three months. Um, Korea. We can see there's some periosteal reaction along the lateral aspect of the distal humerus and also some lucent areas. Um, I would want to know if he had any history of prior trauma. Well, he's an inline skater, so he probably has had some prior trauma, but I'm not sure. About that. He, yeah, it's kind yeah. of a, a lytic lesion as well in the distal humerus. I, I think it needs further evaluation with cross-sectional imaging. Okay. So it's chronic periosteal thickening here, so this has been around for a while. I mm -hmm. don't, it doesn't really look laminated, so this looks kind of like a benign type periosteal reaction. And this is a child also. Child, right. Mm -hmm. So here's the MR. Here's your imaging you wanted. Okay, so here again we can see that chronic appearing periosteal reaction and um, also ultrasound. Uh, Oh, okay, so we have some extension there of fluid through the cortex, so it could be like a Brody abscess. Okay, there are the axial images. Mm -hmm. How's the laminate so, appearance here? Yes. So again, I'm concerned about a chronic infection like a Brody's abscess. We have that lucent tract going through the cortex and adjacent fluid. Yeah, it certainly could be. Yeah, at this point, it would be more than just a Brody's abscess. And you usually don't get all this kind of periosteal reaction if it's if it's a typical Brody's abscess. So I'd certainly think about other things as well. Uh, here is the uh, uh, tibia ultrasound. Here are X-ray images of the tibia, which also had symptoms. Here's the here are the chest X-ray. It's really a little bit hard to see on the screens, but you can see a lot of little tiny dots in the lung fields. Here's this. So a chronic infectious process like um, tuberculosis or yeah, I, um, I guess it could also be an infiltrative disorder. Well, here's the spine. I think you're uh, good to think about TB. We can see that there are multiple levels of bone edema uh, within the spine. Uh, with TB, you'd like to see uh, paraspinous abscesses, cold abscesses. We can certainly see it goes in just your elements here, multiple mm -hmm. disease, and this is pretty, pretty typical tuberculosis, and it's uh, kind of earlier mid-stages. Later on, you'd get big cold abscesses, uh, but good, you're right, this is, this is tuberculosis. Okay. Let's see soft tissue swollen overlying that and the medial over overlying the medial condo right there. I don't think it's kind of hard to see from here. I don't see any definite bony involvement. And now we see this heterogeneous fluid collection along that medial aspect of the distal ulna. It looks fairly dirty, and then there's some edema with some adjacent musculature. Um, 
and that looks like now it's extended into the joint. So this looks, and how long have we been going on for? One year, exacerbation two months ago, HPV positive, diabetes positive. Okay. Um, so for like a acute septic joint, you just want to see, you probably want to see like more destructive changes for something like staph or something, but. Yeah, this isn't this, acute. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. that's what I'm saying. We don't see like. Okay. If, if this were a staph or a strep, the destroyed. elbow would be destroyed. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So what I was trying to say is we don't see that. Okay. So I'd probably rule out some. I guess you could still have some really in, like kind of insidious onset uh, chronic infection, but I assume it's probably sterile. So, so what's your differential? Um, you know, again, something like maybe TB again or some fungal, so some atypical TB, infection. fungal, something fungal. atypical. And yeah. now we're showing yeah, this is TB. Okay. Yeah, I didn't see it there either. I didn't see it. So you can get monoarthritis, and then you can get uh, then typically if it's TB, it will eventually spread and have multi-system disease. And then here we can see some destructive changes from chronic TB in the right hip and other areas. Okay, so it's there we go. So a 20-year-old male with left elbow pain for three weeks, uh, no trauma history. Um, Looks like there is a lytic lesion within the distal uh, uh, humerus. Right there. Um, diaphysis. I think everything else looks okay. Oh, yeah, this is a 20 year old male. Now, why? Maybe that was old injury, old fracture. And then you can see a well, uh, a lucent lesion. And actually, it's, it ex extends past the cortex, so I think it's open. There, yeah. So it's not, and it it, it, it lights up on the uh, nuclear medicine little scan, and there is quite a bit of soft tissue edema as well as a uh, joint infection, or at least fluid within the joint space, complex fluid within the joint space. So, um, and uh, some osseous edema of the distal humerus as well, and some uh, minimal cortical erosion there. So, be worried about um, an infection in the septic joint here. Um, what kind of organism would you expect? Well, uh, based on the fact that it's already gone on for three weeks, again, looking for, uh, you know, probably, yeah, again, a mycoplasma or a, a less less acute infection, like plasma yeah. tuberculosis. Yeah, if it was oh, from Victorville, you'd be thinking about uh, uh, toxic. Uh, when I was in Korea as a, as a battalion surgeon in the Army, I saw quite a few cases. It was extremely common in uh, South Korea early on. Now, now, of course, it's a modern country, but I'm surprised uh, that you're, you're getting so many cases uh, from from there, John. Um, yeah. the, the, these, are, these are heavily picked through uh, probably thousands of cases, and they just send the unusual ones. Yeah, I guess it's just, um, endemic there yeah early on uh, in america we didn't see that well we had our share of tuberculosis we even had tuberculosis center yeah um, that's why people were on bcg and, um, yeah. and so on yeah. okay uh jennifer 60 year old female from molokai um, so she has polyarthralgia and rash, and she has severe degenerative. You know degenerative. your history, you know your history of Hawaii. Um, I do have not know that much about Hawaiian infection. Okay, fine. Go ahead then. Go ahead. Uh, so severe degenerative up. disease with erosions and overlying soft tissue swelling um this could be uh there's also some density i'm thinking this is some type of um fu fungal or parasitic infection mark atrophy of the muscles here mark destruction yeah. of the space a lot of synovial activity. it's a, a neurologic um, uh, 
problems. So how about that? A big node here. And this is what the skin looks like. Something in the Bible. Uh, An old disease. Leprosy, which I've never seen. <laughs> well, you just saw a case. <laughs> so it can be bird destructive. Molokai has a well known leper colony on it. So um, it, it's endemic in California. Yeah. And it's actually, it, it's around a lot because it's, it's a disease that you can control, but you can't get rid of it very well. So uh, uh, people have chronic treatment. So that's leprosy. Here, here's some other images of leprosy patients. And the, the, uh, the leper colony uh, formed there uh, from Father Damien. And, uh, and that's, uh, so I think it's, and it's still there. So. That island, I think, um... Uh, is occupied by very wealthy people today. I hope they're and, in Malacca. Yeah. 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 And they don't have um, the problem anymore. Right. Yep. Okay, so male with fever, redness, and so on, right arm for seven days. I mean, there's. So there's. If you see edema, that kind of looks like it's on the deep facial planes, kind of. Encasing all the muscles of the it's upper a, arm. It's a sub-Q fat as so, well as the, yeah. the muscles kind of diffusely. It's at seven days. Uh, and there's a lot of low signal. I'm wondering if that's to be gas. Like I'm afraid it's like some kind of like necrotizing fasciitis okay. or something like that. Okay. So they operated. So if you kind of dry up with necrotic changes, and it doesn't affect the right spot. Look for the thing. Necrosis is not in people. So it was necrosis, but it wasn't really... So this was necrotizing cellulitis, but they didn't come up with an organism. Oh, that's weird. Yeah. Um, was the patient on antibiotics, John? Uh, I'm sure they were, but I, I don't know definitely, but I'm sure they were. Yeah, that, I would think so. They don't put on the weight on that. Usually, usually you can take tissue and get um, the uh, path slices and you, you can see the organism. Yeah. All right, so this is a 39 year old female with elbow swelling. There's a significant edema posterior to the olecranon here. Uh, on the axial sequences, I kind of see that as well. It's, I don't know if that's a, is that a torn triceps. Or they thought it was a torn triceps, mm -hmm. but uh, and it was very painful. So they really thought it was a torn triceps. And there's a lot of edema within the muscle, uh, uh, kind of throughout the, the muscle. Uh, but this was a spider bite. Wow. And uh, these can these can be very confusing if you don't think about it, because they can, uh, most of the time you think about muscle strains or tears or something, uh, but uh, uh, and uh, and I've uh, uh, sometimes a differential comes down between a spider bite and uh, and a gout. Uh, sometimes with spider bites, you tend to get a lot more muscle edema, but uh, and you can get a lot of necrosis of the muscle as well uh, with some of the spider bites. Yeah, like the, the brown recluse thing that can be pretty. They don't get treated yeah. too pretty extensive. They yeah. have that here, don't they? Yeah, the they brown do. Here. Yeah. Okay, uh, Jennifer. So this is a 32-year-old female one month after a burn. And you can see that there's some, diff there is diffuse thickening and increased signal and edema in kind of throughout the anterior compartment musculature. Um, so I with the history of burn, I'd be concerned about a developing compartment syndrome and muscle necrosis. Yep. That's exactly what it was. Uh, uh, that's kind of uh, 
late in the game too, isn't it? It is very late in the game. You have to get on. Uh, that, that, that's unfortunate. Yeah. For the patient. So, so John, do you want to tell us what happened here? Well, what you do if you um, suspect the condition, in my day, when you suspected it, we operated uh, a release of compartments. Uh, there's more than more than one in a forearm. Um, and they have to make sure that you get them all. Um, uh, you make small incisions and then you just um, open the fascia uh, up and down. Uh, in fact, we use the meniscal knives to, 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 to do that. It worked very well. Um, fortunately, we, you don't see it very often, but uh, acute trauma uh, of any kind can produce compartment syndromes. Burns are actually um, not that un not that common um, as far as uh, producing this condition. I think the patient had a burn and probably had a um, maybe an infection. Also, uh, I, I can't be sure. Obviously, I don't know this case. Yeah. Um, but anyway, um, compartment syndromes are not that uncommon. Um, uh, most times seen in fractures and um, and acute trauma to the muscles, obviously. So uh, and, you, well, uh, you can measure the uh, the pressure in the compartments. Uh, it's, it's still not a very um, accurate type of measurement, but. Um, my my recommendation is if you think of it, open it. So the pressure goes up in the compartment uh, to near systolic pressures, and therefore you no longer get perfusion, and you get dead to the muscles due to lack of perfusion. So that's why you have to open it up to keep the pressure down, so you can maintain perfusion. And you can see that axial again. All right, Michael. Um, so, first image, see these kind of updated cystic fluid collections around the distal humerus. It looks like they're probably intraarticular, looking on the second image where they are. And then on the third image, the axials, they look heterogeneous, kind of dirty fluid. And we have a history like this is acute. There's soft tissue edema as well, kind of overlying on that medial aspect. So, um, tissue. so given no history, what are you what are you thinking about? Well, one, I'm worried about like a you know an infected joint effusion. Another okay. thing could be if it could be some sort of chronic infection. Yeah. yeah, it could also be inflammatory. Yeah, this uh, is synovitis. Yeah, this is chronic synovitis okay. rheumatoid. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, sure. oh, we had a. You're a very good knee today. Um, all right, so here we can. Is this is this extensive edema of the supinator muscle on the second image? And um, I don't know if there's a focal erosive change of the uh, lateral aspect of the humerus there. Yeah, I think this is just synovial thickening just synovial and thickening. Uh, just a part of the joint space. All right, so we could think about gout here. We could think about inflammatory arthropathy. Uh, looks like synovitis here. It's, it's complex fluid collection within the joint. Um, yeah, I mean, it could, again, it's pretty wide differential. I, I, I wouldn't yeah. consider infection in this case necessarily on my top. I'd rather but consider inflammatory arthropathy. It could be chronic infection, right. but that in the U.S. that would be much less likely. You have the erosion here. It's not a classic location for gout. If you're on the olecranon primarily, then I would consider gout. Uh, this turned out to be rheumatoid arthritis. Jennifer, what do you think of this one? Okay, so here we have just diffuse synovial thickening and a large joint effusion. And there are some degenerative changes. Big erosions here. 
Okay, our erosion. So again, we're thinking chronic infectious process or inflammatory arthropathy. The erosion, uh, the erosion has gone all the way through the distal humerus. Okay, so this could be gout. Could be gout, uh, but again, uh, gout doesn't typically present with this kind of primarily joint. Uh, like it can, but but it's not character, not characteristic of that they have the, this amount of involvement just of a joint space. Gout more typically involves in feces, uh, tendon insertions, uh, areas like that. This is primarily a synovitis of the joint. And again, this is rheumatoid arthritis. Michael, this was an older elderly lady who for um, several months now has had a swelling in the back of her elbow that she punctures every day and drains. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, there's an irregular DCM fusion with the olecranon. Okay. Uh, for so, some, you know. And then so what are you large, thinking? What am I thinking? Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, there's a large bursal effusion. Like you said, gout affects the olecranon, so I don't know if she's... But gout's going to be more of a panis and not so much fluid that you... Yeah, there's a lot of clear. I mean, the first thing I would think about would be infection because yeah. he's been sick and needle. Yeah, she's just decompressing yeah. every day. Yeah, which is, you see there, there we can see more evidence. But you can see there is a lot of synovial thickening here. Mm -hmm. It's a different signal from the and, from the fluid itself. In the bone that and the listen at middle image, it looks pretty well porticated. Yeah. Around it, like it doesn't look like very like aggressive. Like it's not getting rapidly destructive. Yeah. I guess. Well, there, there you can see a lot of the synovial thickening. Yeah, so Mark synovial thickening around the elbow joint. And this is another, another rheumatoid arthritis. Oh, all right. Uh, was this the only joint uh, involved, John? Uh, I'm sure it wasn't. I don't remember the details, but I'm sure it was not the only joint involved. I wouldn't think so. Well, uh, here there's uh, quite a bit of destruction of the uh, humeral ulnar joint. There's some periarticular erosions. Um, there's uh, remodeling. Um, you can see more. There's a little bit of a joint effusion here. Uh, I don't really see much synovitis um, within this joint. Uh, Did you say remodeling? Yes. Okay. I'm not sure what that means. Mostly edema and, and, and the, the cortical margins look irregular uh, of the ulnar humeral joint there. Yeah, I think that's mostly erosive changes. Erosive change, okay. So end stage of rheumatoid. Okay. Yeah, so another rheumatoid. Okay. Jennifer, what do you think of this patient? Okay, so history of lupus, multiple one-month-old masses. Uh, so we can see several subcutaneous nodules in the, I think we're in the level of the arm. Yes. Um, so this is probably lupus erythematosus with the characteristic nodules. Oh, can I go ahead? So this is the panis that you can get with lupus. So lupus with MR, you know, you can have all kinds of arthritic changes. You can get soft tissue thickenings like this. Uh, and then uh, it, it's uh, the other MR signature of lupus is multiple uh, areas of bone infarcts. And that, that treatment can also produce changes. Right, yeah. So it, it, it becomes kind of complex. So sudden pain, swelling, although they're on dialysis, chronic renal failure, and clinically they are worried about septic arthritis. I do think I see a joint, maybe a small joint infusion. I think there's some reasons to be behind that. Um, so we do see a joint infusion on a uric acid stent. So joint infusion, it enhances, maybe the synovium around the joint's a little bit kind of mildly thickened throughout. Uh, no bony destruction that I can really see. And again, like you said, with the uric acid, you'd be worried about something like gout. Yeah, and here you can see all these gouty Little deposits crystals. here. Yeah. 
uh, in the synovial tissues, and that was gout. <clears throat> um, here we see um, soft tissue edema posterior to the olecranon, um, and uh, looks pretty focal there. Um, uh, you have the arrow sign uh, with uh, focal edema in the uh, the olecranon bursa. Um, but, but, but notice the character of this. This doesn't look like just a fluid. It's complex, yeah. Like we see in what we typically say, electron bursitis. Mm -hmm. uh, it's much more complex than that. Yeah, almost like synovium there. Yeah, so what do you think it is? Uh, is it, is it a, another gout? Okay. Yes. Uh, Jennifer. All right, so here we can see increased signal and synovial thickening and fluid at the triceps attachment to the olecranon. So this would be another case since it's at the triceps attachment. I'd be concerned about gout. There's an erosion there along the olecranon. And you can see the typical very sharply defined erosives with little spicules of bone next to it. Uh, those are very characteristic of gout. And you can see a little spicule here. The erosions you see in rheumatoid arthritis, you can get kind of rounded erosions, but you tend not to get these kind of spicule appearance of the bone uh, in, in rheumatoid arthritis. It's a little bit more. Uh, uh, rheumatoid arthritis also doesn't affect uh, the tip of the olecranon um, in most cases, does it, John? That's correct. Uh, so that's that, that's a tip off. Yep. Uh, Good. We will add the pendant there. Um, I'm looking at this. Is that just a lot of like, I can't tell if that's just all fatty atrophy or if that's all edema throughout the musculature. That one right there where it seems the brachial is coming down and touching the ulna. Um, mm -hmm. This is fat suppressed. This is not so fat suppressed. So that That's a T1. Like Mark fatty atrophy. Okay. So what do you think is going on here? Um, well, I guess one, that could be a, a nervous issue. It, it could be a, yeah, a chronic denervation. Yeah. And this happens to be muscular dystrophy. Uh, Okay, um, here you can see a chronic fracture deformity with lucency of the proximal radius. Um, I don't know if there's a pathologic fracture there. Um, you can kind of see marrow replacement within the distal radius. It looks like it's somewhat enhancing um, throughout and it extends into the muscle and past the cortex. Okay, so this is uh, this time, this is three months later. Oh, uh, three months later. Oh, okay. So now we're looking at the knee, and it looks like there's extensive synovial thickening and edema, um, also involving the posterior aspect of the medial thermal condyle. Um, and it looks like there. Oh, it looks like there's. Um, it looks like an enhancing cystic lesion within the posterior medial thermal condyle, almost like a infection. Um, and here we're looking at multiple areas of lucency uh, on the radiograph involving the hips and the pelvis and portions of the vertebral spine. So this is a rugged jersey spine. Rugged jersey. What does that make you think about? Um, this is it looking at sickle. Oh yeah, I mean osteodystrophy. Okay. So we go back here. If you look at the kidneys. Uh, the uh, calcifications are seen. Oh yeah. Okay. Uh, that 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 can give you a little bit of a clue, I guess. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Think about some other things that we don't typically think about, Jennifer. Um, so 55-year-old female with malaise and weight loss, she has 
massive lymphadenopathy, possible concern for metastasis or lymphoma, and she has a solitary fibular lesion. Uh, so with the lymphadenopathy, um, so some type of infiltrative process. Um, hey, something you see every day. <laughs> okay, Rosa Dorfman disease. Which is uh, histiocytosis with uh, adenopathy. So normally you get osseous lesions in about 8%, generally self-limited and usually regresses spontaneously. So, you know, I've seen a couple of these uh, over the years just in the practice, but uh, it's, it's easy to forget about. Do they usually just have one solitary osseous lesion or multiple? My experience has been multiple, and I've usually seen them fairly symmetric. The ones I've seen have been in the legs. Can we go back to the... I mean, so if you, if you saw that as like a number without patient degree, I guess they're different folks here. Yeah, I mean, it... it uh, the, it looks like it's relatively benign or slow growing because the bone's remodeled. It hasn't broken through the bone. So you're looking at something that, that's uh, most likely benign or very uh, slow growing sort of, sort of thing. And uh, uh, the differential can be fairly wide. It can be there are a whole bunch of fibrous lesions that can do this. Like and fibrous so you, uh, the fibrous dysplasia, absolutely, depending upon the age group. Uh, certainly, if this were a kid, I would be concerned about that. I don't really see a periosteal reaction uh, to to be concerned about the more malignant type lesions. Uh, but uh, this is the sort of thing that has to be biopsied if you can't make. It there are no, no compartments uh, either, so the cysts are kind of um, yeah. are, are out. Yeah. Okay, here we go. There's another lesion. This is kind of a related type lesion in a sense. Yeah, so I see this kind the, of lytic. The other one is the adults. This is one that's typically seen in kids. So it's like a lytic expansile lesion within the. Uh, Proximal radius, so it's kind of thinning of the cortex, so the cortex is yeah. like broken. This this is a lesion that you will be seeing in clinical practice. So is this like EG or Langerhans cell? Yeah. Eosinophilic yeah, granuloma. If this is eosinophilic granuloma. Yeah. Fairly common disease. Mm -hmm. And I hear a two-year-old female with elbow pain, distal humerus along the needle aspect. You see some periosteal reaction and a little bit of lucency there. Um, it does light up on the bone scan. On the MRI, you can see that there is um, cortical, uh, that the, cor uh, the cortex is broken. You see extensive um, soft tissue and then some increased edema involving um, both the osteostructures and the adjacent uh, soft tissue musculature. And um, looks like it's a pretty heterogeneous, and with the periosteal reaction, I, I mean, I'm I'm still concerned that this could be a malignancy, depending on how it presented. Well, yeah, depending on how it presents, uh, this this particular kid wasn't very sick. Mm -hmm. If they were sick, I would really be concerned about an infection. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, you know, this could be staph or strep or so, something like that. If they were sick, but. To have this in someone who has a typical bacterial infection, they're probably very sick, they're septicemic, and it's really a medical emergency. This patient wasn't that sick. Uh, uh, and you can see a lot of kind of edema. This almost looks like there's kind of enhancement around some fluid in through here. And there, there certainly is bone destruction here, but, but it just doesn't have that characteristic configuration that I would typically see in an in a, in a malignant tumor. Usually you'll get destruction and it'll grow out from the lesion and won't spread around the bone like this. Mm -hmm. uh, with all this edema here, uh, this is a more aggressive form of uh, uh, histiocytosis.
Jennifer. Okay, so here we have an ultrasound, it looks like a three-year-old male, and we're looking at the left elbow. Um, I see subcutaneous thickening along the left elbow. Um, we're showing some vascularity along the left elbow as well. And here there is some subcutaneous edema along the posterior elbow. Um, okay, so it's a mass within the subcutaneous tissue along the posterior elbow. Uh, it's not fat signal intensity. Um, All these subcutaneous lesions, they come mm -hmm. up with a lot of different kinds, shapes, and so forth. And a lot of people get MRs, and I think the MRs are typically very nonspecific in these lesions. I think it's very hard to make a specific diagnosis on subcut subcutaneous lesions, so I usually recommend biopsy. Uh, this happened to be granuloma annulare, uh, the subcutaneous form. Okay, so that's uh, here. So we've kind of finished the elbow except for tumors, and we'll uh, we'll talk, maybe it's what I'll do uh, next week. Uh, why don't we start just a review of soft, musculoskeletal or soft tissue and bone tumors. And then after we do the tumors, we'll come back to other joints and, uh, and continue our march through the rest of the joints of the body. Okay, okay. any questions? All right, thanks. Thank you. Well, have a great Thanksgiving, everyone. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. And, Happy and, Thanksgiving. And next, 